At the moment, the world's longest flight is about 18 hours long. But what sort of plan and procedures do they need to follow in order to stay up in the sky for that length of time? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the ninth class in the flight planning series. Today we're going to be having a look at long range flights. There's a few special things we need to consider when we're flying from one side of the planet to the other and that's what we're going to break down and have a quick look at in this class. Normally when flying a twin engine aircraft we have to pick a route that allows us to be within one hour single engine flight time of a suitable en route alternate and the destination alternate has to also be within this range. Suitable meaning usable in terms of performance, it's basically got a long enough runway, it's open, it's got at least one instrument approach, it has sufficient air traffic control and firefighting services in case of an emergency. And we also have to be sure that the weather is above the minimums required for that instrument approach in terms of cloud base and visibility for our predicted landing time, plus or minus one hour. If we fly an aircraft with four engines, we don't need to worry about this one hour rule when picking our route. This is because if we have an engine failure, which is already pretty unlikely, then we still have three engines, which is already more than a twin engine aircraft has. And we continue. And that means we can continue, sorry, with one uh, engine in operative safely. In the early days of long range flights, the most popular routes were between North America and Europe. But due to this one hour rule, it meant that a strange route had to be followed where the aircraft had to fly up towards Iceland and Greenland, which significantly lengthened the uh, distance of the route. And that meant that more fuel was used and it was more expensive. Then came along the four engine planes like the DC-8 and the 747, and they didn't have to follow this one hour rule. So it meant that they could fly a more direct route, cutting down on the distance flown and the cost of fuel used to fly that route. The problem was that those two extra engines burnt more fuel than just the two engines, obviously. But the trade-off between shorter route versus more fuel burnt per engine was worth it for some companies and the 747 and the DC-8 were staples of long range travel for a long time. One of the reasons we don't see many 747s around these days is that ETOPS were invented. ETOPS or extended twin operations allowed aircraft to fly outside of this one hour radius from a suitable en route alternate. This meant that those previous short routes that were only available to the big four engine aircraft were now available to twin engine aircraft burning much less fuel. Some airlines continued to still fly the big four engine aircraft but changes to the cost of fuel and new more efficient engines and aircraft have led to the decline of the big four engine beasts. Even Emirates who love the big four engine super jumbo A380 have a huge fleet of 777s which can handle most of the routes the A380 can and have orders uh, in for the new A350s at the time of filming which will for sure be driven by the cheaper cost of fuel and these new aircraft having similar ranges when using ETOPS. In order to do ETOPS, you must get ETOPS approval from the relevant aviation authority. And it basically comes down to how reliably and safely you can run and maintain your aircraft. You need to have pilots, engineers, and dispatch staff that are all trained in ETOPS in order to keep the safety and reliability standard high. Depending on the levels of the reliability, you can get different ETOPS approval time. For instance, ETOPS 120, We'd allow you to fly 120 minutes or two hours uh, at single engine speed from a suitable en route alternate and ETOPS 150 would be two hours 30. So if you think about this route, if you had this as your one hour range, maybe say that's your, your two hour range, you're already looking like a more direct route across the Atlantic. The higher times, the ETOPS 150s, etc., require a stricter procedure to improve reliability some figures to give you an idea is ETOPS 120 needs an in-flight sh in flight shutdown rate of less than one time per 20,000 hours, whereas ETOPS 180, it needs to be one time per 50,000 hours. This in-flight shutdown might be either due to a failure or as a precautionary measure. It's not just that the engine needs to be reliable, 
It needs to be that the fuel systems are reliable, the air systems that are reliable, anything that runs off the engine that might need the engine to be shut down in case of an emergency. And these uh, pieces of equipment that need to be reliable will be defined in an MEL document, which is a minimum equipment list which has a list of requirements for ETOPS and I might say no ETOPS if such and such a failure happens. For instance, if we had a failure of our anti-ice system, the MEL might tell us we can fly as long as we fly icing, avoid icing conditions and that we can no longer do uh, use that aircraft on ETOPS routes. When we venture out of a country's airspace and we fly into international airspace, we might follow a route based off from one coordinate to another. The North Atlantic tracks are an example of these sort of routes. They actually date back to commercial shipping routes across the Atlantic Ocean, but they've been adapted and upgraded for use in aviation. The main reason these routes were developed for use in aviation is a lack of radar coverage over the oceans. This means it is hard to keep track of where the aircraft are, so if we know they are on this defined route flying at a certain speed, we can make predictions about where they will reappear on radar. Say a plane crossed this waypoint here at uh, 1 p.m. traveling uh, 120 knots, then this point here, 60 nautical miles later, would be crossed at 1.30, just when it comes back into radar range. If it hasn't appeared on radar by this point, or within a certain tolerance, the aircraft might be off track or something worse may have happened. And obviously, that's not 60 nautical miles, that's just for ease of calculations. It also allows aircraft to have safe separation from one another along this route. If we tell an aircraft to fly at 120 knots between these two waypoints, and then the next aircraft has to be delayed by five minutes, then in theory, they'll both keep that separation of five minutes the whole way along the route, keeping them a safe distance from one another. There are multiple NAT tracks uh, this is just one on the page for uh, ease of drawing and just to make it simple and less complicated. But there's going to be one to the north, one to the south, many, many routes along the North Atlantic. And they are different every day to take advantage of the jet stream's fluctuating position. So the aircraft flying towards Europe will want to fly with, within the jet stream as it is a westerly wind. Basically, it comes from the west and it's blowing east. This way the journey times are lower and there's a nice tailwind along the route. The opposite is true for the routes flying west. They want to stay out of the jet stream. They want to avoid that headwind. So if you have a look online for the NAT tracks for today and also have a look at the jet stream position, you should be able to see this uh, pattern. And some clever people in air traffic control planning centers work out some of the most optimal routes and publish them for airlines to select the day prior to the flights across the Atlantic and a flight, path, flight plan can be made according to the one that they select or if that route is at full capacity uh, you might get assigned a route. Generally speaking the ones going um, flying west travel a bit further north because the jet stream comes from around this area and flows up towards uh, the northern part of the UK. So the aircraft flying from America to Europe will want to go in this and stay lower down, taking advantage of more time in the jet stream, and the aircraft going the other way might come a bit further north and down to avoid flying within that jet stream. Sometimes the most optimal route between two airports is most efficiently done by flying over the polar regions. This may mean that we have to navigate using polar stereographic charts, which you may have learned about in general navigation. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, go and check the video link below for the GNAV series talking about polar stereographic charts and grid navigation. When navigating through the polar regions, it's a bit tricky because the point of north changes a lot. Say we're at this point here, west is in this direction, off to the left-hand side of the page. But as we travel over towards this point, west, reference to true north, is actually more down towards the bottom of the page. Magnetic north is also not much use in this region because the true magnetic north pole is somewhere in northern Canada. So our magnetic north might be as much as 100 
80 degrees different to true north if we're flying within this sort of region in between here. So what we do is we can navigate using something called grid north. This means we have a set direction that we think of as north and reference all of our directions according to this new north. It requires converting from a true north direction into a grid north direction. In an aircraft, this will be taken care of by a flight management computer or a flight navigation computer. But back in the old days, a navigator would be in the back of the cockpit calculating these new directions and headings using something called a gyroscopic compass, which can be used to hold any meridian of longitude as north. Usually this is the 000 or Greenwich meridian. Then the navigator in the back could use this compass to give us a constant track that we could follow to navigate between two points. The difference between grid north and true north direction at a specific point is called the grid convergence and it can be calculated using the difference in longitude between uh, the waypoint and the reference meridian. So at this point here, um, let's say that this is 45 east, then the difference between grid north and true north is just going to be 45 because our grid north is referenced to the Greenwich meridian here. So if we look at our true north direction, uh, let's say that was, I don't know, 145 for easy maths, then our grid north direction is going to be less than that. It's going to be 100 degrees north, according to the grid. In this case, our grid convergence, our difference, which is going to be this angle in here, is going to be 45 degrees, because that's the difference in longitude, and it's going to be 45 degrees west. Our grid uh, convergence, sorry, not our grid north, our grid convergence. So the grid convergence at this point is a 45 degree west grid convergence, because the north pole and true north is west of that direction. Then we can use a very easy uh, calculation if we knew our grid convergence to convert between a grid direction and a true direction. So we've got the true direction plus the grid convergence equals the grid correction. And we've got to remember that the grid convergence, if it's west, it's negative, And if it's east, it's positive. So if we take our example here, our true direction we said was 145. We've got the west or negative grid convergence. So we've minus 45, which gives us our grid direction, which was 100 degrees according to grid. Then we would use that 100 degree direction in reference to grid north to help us navigate throughout this region. It's quite simple to understand, um, I think at least, but if you need any more information, I'd go and check out those videos in the general navigation section.